Okay, so welcome back. If you've been watching the uh, the first two parts of this um, little build-up series on the Samurai. So this is part three. So off camera, I spent a bunch of time cleaning up the housing, um, getting all the old grease and 98 out of the housing, cleaning the tubes out. Um, new, I've installed the new uh, kingpin bearing races, um, the new tube seals. And then uh, basically got that all cleaned up. The front diff had taken a hit before, so while the, the third member was out, I pounded, I pounded the cover back into shape and then installed this uh, diff armor. Um, I believe this is from uh, Zooks Off-Road. Uh, the customer supplied it, so I'm not sure where he bought it, but I'm pretty sure that's who builds these. Pretty cool unit. It's the first time I've put one of these on. Um, but it's got lots of drainage, and it's really easy to put on. It's just got eight stitch welds all the way around on those, on those legs. Um, it's kind of my my new favorite diff armor for these, uh, something that's store-bought. Um, so in this video, basically I'm going to show the installation of the locker. Um, I've got a pretty good detailed video already uh, from installing the e-locker in the front of my Samurai. Um, so here's kind of the tools you need, a uh, dial indicator. Um, if you don't own one of these, you can get stuff like this at Harbor Freight pretty cheap and it's plenty good enough. Um, so basically, I'll get it set up and I'll show, but so you need this guy, uh, a 12, a 14, a 17. Um, this is a homemade tool I built for turning these uh, spanner nuts or whatever you want to call these. Um, but you can buy tools for this or you know you could use a like a blunted off uh, chisel and a hammer and tap them around um, anyway this guy's kind of fun or kind of easy though you can put a ratchet on it and it makes it real clean and easy and it doesn't damage the uh, the holes on that spanner nut um, so anyway where I like to start is putting the indicator on there and figuring out with the backlash. So while holding the pinion from turning, you rock this back and forth, and this should move, um, you know, I think it's uh, six to 12 thousandths, but I'll double check that spec before I do it. Um, so check what it is, write it down, and then when you pull this all apart, you wanna put it back where it was unless it's out of spec. Um, and if that's the case, there's you know an, uh, a reason for it. Um, but this diff seems to be in pretty good shape. The bearings all feel good. Um, you know, it wasn't leaking or anything. So I'm gonna, I'll get this all pulled apart and then uh, show you what's next. Okay, so here's how I've got my little indicator set up. You want, the throw of this to be tangent to the rotation as best you can. Um, you can't always do that just because the shape of the teeth to get a nice clean push on that tip to where you're not hitting the side or anything. Um, hopefully I can do this with one hand, but this thing's at about eight thousandths. Um, so that's, that's well within spec. So that's where I'm gonna keep it when I put it back together. So now that I've confirmed that the backlash is okay, um, pull these 12 millimeter headed bolts. These have a little, it's a little keeper that keeps this from rotating. Pull that off on both sides. And then the four carrier cap bolts, uh, these are 17s. Um, pull those apart. Uh, it's real important to make sure that these go exactly where they came from. You can't put this one over here because these are, um, machined as, as a together. So the threads, you know, half of the threads are in the housing and half are in this cap. And if you switch sides, the threads inside won't line up. Um, it's a pretty good idea if you're new to this or don't do it often. To, maybe you could take like a center punch and do like one punch here and one punch here. And then on the other side, do two and two. That way it's labeled, but I'm pretty methodical when I do this. Um, I'll lay out a paper towel and I'll take everything and just put it on the side it came from 
and uh, not deviate from that at all. Um, if you're pulling this apart just to do like a, a say like a lock right or a Spartan locker um, and everything checks out good with the backlash and the bearings are all good, um, you can mark this nut with like a paint pen between the nut and the housing. And then what, what I usually do is, is we'll rotate this counterclockwise one full turn, same thing on the other side, and then put my thumbs on these. It's kind of easier with two people. Hold the nuts in and pull this out. And then you can pull it apart and, and put the locker inside and put it back together and put it exactly where it was super easily. Um, but being that this is getting a new carrier, um, any minor, minor, minor difference in the dimensions with the bearing, where the bearing seats and the ring gear seats will throw this stuff off. So it's not worth um, keeping track of this stuff when you're putting a new carrier in. So I'm gonna get this all pulled apart and show you the next step. Okay, so I got that all pulled apart. Um, so I've got the carrier, carrier caps, nuts, everything laid out where it goes. Um, so none of this is gonna be reused. Um, so I'm gonna pull these bolts. Um, these are 14 millimeter heads. Um, oh, there it is. These are 14s. Um, and the, in my case, uh, I'm gonna discard these bolts. Um, I got new setup kits. Um, this is kind of my favorite company for this stuff. Um, I'm not sure what the part number is, but anyway, these are available through a lot of the guys that do Suzuki stuff. So these are all, uh, so this is a differential master install kit and it comes with um, all good name brand Japanese made bearings, um, crush sleeve, seal, nut, um, ring gear bolts and shims. Um, so if you're doing a, like a ring and pinion ratio change, um, this is something you'll definitely need because you want to put all new bearings and everything. And it basically gives you everything you need in one kit and it's good high quality stuff. Um, so in this, in the case of this car, um, being that this front differential um, is basically brand new, um, we're just gonna be putting in the carrier bearings onto the new carrier for the locker and uh, leaving this alone because it feels perfect. Um, the rear, um, the rear's a little leaky out of the pinion seal. And so it's gonna be completely pulled down and then I'll put all new bearings in the pinion and, and reset all of that. Um, it's quite a bit more work and uh, you know, the, the, it just doesn't warrant it for the front. Um, and plus we're trying to keep costs down on this job. Um, so for labor labor's sake, uh, I'm just gonna keep those original bearings in, in place. So I'm gonna get this stuff set aside and then I'll get the, uh, I'm gonna get the locker out and uh, show you installing the ring gear. Okay, so here's, um, again, what I'm in, um, installing in the Samurai. So I'm doing two of uh, these TE-208s. Um, you know, these are technically by the, uh, uh, by the application chart, these are for the rear. But if you're going uh, with a locker in the front, um, you definitely want to upgrade the front axle shafts. Uh, the stock axle shafts are 22 spline um, in the front, rears are 26. And if you go with, with chromoly aftermarket front axle shafts, they're all 26 spline. And so then you need basically a rear locker for the front. Um, the third members are identical. Um, you know, they're interchangeable front to rear. The only difference really is uh, the spline count of the side gears inside. Um, some of the newest Samurais, you know, the carrier case itself is a little, is different too, but uh, that's a lot less common. So, gonna get this gear knocked off of here and all cleaned up. Um, 
it's a good idea to really um, run a tap through the threads and get all the old Loctite cut out of the holes and blown out and clean um, and then get it on, installed in here. Um, there's a clip in here. Um, you've got to pull the magnet. So this is the electromagnet that uh, activates the locker. Um, you've got to get that pulled off and out of the way. Um, and again, I showed a lot of this in my uh, first installation video. But you can see in this window right here, there's a pin. There's four of these pins all the way around the unit. And when these pins get pushed down, it engages a coupler between the case of the carrier and this bottom side gear. And it locks the side gear to the case. And, you know, if, if you're familiar with how differentials work, if you lock one gear from turning, then none of the other gears can turn. And then the, the unit is effectively um, one solid piece. Um, so there's four spiders all the way around in these. Um, so they're good and heavy duty. And there's four activation pins so that the, uh, the coupler gets pushed down evenly. And so what happens is, is these ramps, um, when the magnet is engaged, this magnet, um, doesn't rotate with the differential. It's held in place stationary to the housing. And when they engage, this piece drags against this piece and doesn't want to turn. And so it, I can't really do it with my fingers because it's spring loaded, but this piece will want to run up this ramp. And it'll, so it'll push this piece down, engaging that coupler. And then when you turn the switch off on the dash and release the magnet, um, there's a spring inside that disengages it. So let me get this, let me get this clip out of here and I'll show you a better detail of what that looks like. And then uh, we'll start putting this ring gear on. Okay, so I'm gonna try to show this. It's a little awkward with the camera lock in my view, but so you just need like a pick and you carefully get the end of that guy popped up and then just work it around. See, it's got like basically uh, two full turns. You get that pulled off. And then this magnet housing comes off. And so basically just wanna be careful with this, keep it clean. Um, but now that I got that off, you know, I can kind of show the, you know, that's what compresses to engage those pins. So now that that's out of the way, um, the ring gear can slide in place now. So I'm gonna get this, uh, get this off and cleaned up and ready to put on, I'll show you. Okay, so I've got the ring gear off of the old carrier. Got it all cleaned up, degreased, cleaned out all the holes, made sure there was nothing, you know, no foreign material on this surface or this inner surface. This needs to be perfectly clean so that it sits perfectly flat against this surface. And same thing, this, you know, this is brand new and was in a sealed bag, but for my own sanity, I take a paper towel and, and break clean and just wipe that surface, make sure there's no dust or, uh, oil or anything you know these are um they oil this stuff up for shipping so it doesn't corrode um so i just wipe that surface down real nice um in that sumo bearing kit pretty cool um comes with genuine suzuki parts for the uh the ring gear bolts uh and you can see they come pre um coated with loctite So then you just carefully slide the, the ring gear on and you want to make sure to go down nice and straight because it's a real precision fit. And there it is, down on the surface. So then what I like to do is while it's upside down, you can uh, 
can slide it to the edge of your workbench to where you can get the ring gear bolts in. And then you can just carefully rotate that until the hole lines up. And then I'll get these all started like that. It's easier than if this is upside down and you're fighting gravity with the ring gear bolt trying to fall down on you. Um, this is a little easier in my opinion, but uh, something that I've, I've noticed, um, this is the third, this is the third TRE e-locker I've installed now. And uh, I'm just real impressed with the tolerances on them. The, uh, the original carrier, as soon as I pulled the bolts out, the ring gear just fell off. And uh, the fit, the fit in this inner uh, surface is just a little bit snugger than factory, um, which in my opinion is good because then you know you are relying on this centering the ring gear. You know, they're centered with, it, with each other perfectly and there's no play and you're not relying on the bolts um, to hold it centered because if this you know, had any play and wobbled, your, your pattern would go out the window um, and it'd be really hard on your gears. Um, so you can see I haven't put the bearings on yet. I like to do that last. Um, I mean, really with this style locker, you kind of have to because that magnets and you know, you have to have the magnet off to get the ring gear on. And then, you know, once that, that bearing's pressed in place, um, I don't believe, yeah, the magnet wouldn't go on or off anyway. Um, but I like to do it, the bearings last on, you know, any differential I do just be, because you need to keep that stuff absolutely clean. And, uh, you know, the shorter period of time it's on there, the less chance you have for a speck of dust to get in there. On something that's really important, you see a lot of people, you know, drop a bolt in a the hole, then hit it with an impact gun. I never do that. I always make sure that I've got um, two, three turns, fingers, you know, with your fingers. That way, you you know it's not going to cross thread because if you cross thread uh, a bolt in this ring gear, I mean, that's a disaster. All right, so I'm gonna get this, uh, get these bolts tightened up. Um, what I'm probably gonna do, just because I don't remember all these numbers off the top of my head, um, in the description, I will put uh, the torque specs um, for these bolts and the, uh, the carrier cap bolts. Uh, those are really important. And then I'll probably also put the, uh, the backlash specs, just so, uh, you know, that's in an easy to find place. Um, all these numbers are really easy to find online. Um, but if you're watching this video, that way you don't have to go somewhere else to find it. Um, yeah, so that's that. So I'm let me get these, uh, let me get these snugged up and uh, I'll bring you back. Okay, so I figured I'd show kind of two things in one here. Um, you know, it's hard to hold on to a round part. Um, to torque these bolts. Um, some people will clamp this in a shop press. Um, my shop press is down right now, so I can't. Uh, but this is usually my trick anyway for um, when I do Samurai's, is I lay down a tire and wheel face down, um, put in a drum and an axle shaft, and now um, the diff engages the splines on the axle shaft. And um, Usually with lock rights, that's all you got to do. Now this will will lock to the shaft and not turn. But since this is an open diff, you know this this rotates freely. But what I did is is ran some jumper wires to the battery of the Samurai that I'm working on, and so now this magnet is engaged. And you can see, you know, if you imagine this ring being held into the held stationary from rotating, and the diff rotates and you see those two plates wedge apart. And so now this unit is locked. I can't rotate it on the axle shaft. Release it, open diff, free rotation. So that's a pretty simple little uh, 
view of how this thing works. And, you know, and obviously it works both directions if you're driving forwards or backwards. Um, pretty simple, pretty, uh, really pretty foolproof design in my mind. Um, so there you go. I'm going to get these torqued up and then, uh, we'll install the bearings and get this dropped back into the case and reset the backlash. Okay. So I got the bearings installed. Um, so I find a, a socket that fits perfectly on the inner race of the bearing. You know, I do it without this in place and you want to hit not the cage, but just that inner race. Um, so usually, you know, if you've got a socket set that goes to, you know, my set goes to inch and a half, but you know, a decent sized socket that fits on there. Um, you know, you can use a press or whatever. Again, uh, my press is, is uh, actually broken right now. So I just hit them with a socket and a hammer. Um, I kind of like that way anyway, because you know, with a press, you never know how much force you're really putting on it unless you have a, you know, a fancy press with a gauge on it. Um, with a decent sized hammer, you know, you can feel it and it, it makes its own sound when it's moving. And if something's not moving, you can, you know, correct yourself before it gets to be too late or put too much force on this and damage it somehow. Um, so now that the bearings are in, um, both sides, ring gear bolts are torqued. It's ready to go into the case after you drill a hole for the wiring. So, you know, obviously on the magnet, you've got this uh, wiring lead. And so uh, there needs to be a hole in the case for that to pass through. Um, so I'm gonna get that dropped in there just so we can kind of lay the wire, you know, in a place that's uh, clear of obstructions or not gonna get wound up and then figure out where the best place to drill is. So let me get that dropped in there and I'll bring it back. Okay, so here we are with the, the locker dropped in back into the case. Um, nothing's adjusted yet. I just got it uh, lo loosely set into position um, just to get an idea on the wiring. So if you saw my um, video from a year or so back when I put the first one in my Samurai, um, you'll notice that I had to grind um, these caps and there was uh, like these kind of like L brackets they came off of the bearing housing, or I mean the uh, magnet housing um, to grip onto here to keep it from rotating. Um, they've changed that design and I honestly like this way better. Um, so it's got a post, you know, because you, you got to imagine all this stuff turning, the magnet has to stay stationary. So this post is there and then just this simple bracket bolts in place with your, uh, carrier bolts. So there's no modifications needed for this part. Um, pretty cool. I like this. Um, the second unit I installed in my Samurai is this style as well. Um, and I don't think the other, uh, the other style was bad, but this is just a lot easier um, because you had to grind this um, to a pretty precise um, tolerance or dimension. So this is, this is cool. So anyway, um, lighting's not very good where I'm at here, but um, down in there is the oil channel. And so basically this wire is gonna, it's gonna be plenty away from the, the teeth of the gears here. So I'm just gonna drill a hole. Let me get a flashlight. There we go. So there's that oil passage that um, basically oil flings off the ring gear through that channel and gets into the pinion bearings. So I'm going to drill a hole just to the right of it for the wiring to come through. And then that way it'll be, uh, you know, it's really <laughs> about the only option, but it'll be uh, out of the way and uh, won't be like in a completely direct oil flinging path, but um, the little pass-through um, fitting they give you has got seals and stuff in it. So I don't think that's uh, that much of a concern. But I'm going to get this all pulled back out, and then 
I'll show you like with a paint pin where I actually decide to decide to put the hole for sure. So uh, give me one second to pull this stuff all out. Okay, so here's where I decided to drill the hole. Um, so this is the top. You know, the top sur surface as it sits in the car. There's this kind of triangular shape right here, just outboard. Um, but you've got to use your own judgment. Um, you know, castings all vary. But what you're trying to find is is some place where there's no obstructions. It's like kind of a uniform thickness. Um, so here's the little pass-through fitting. Um, the thread is a uh, M12 by 1.5. So you drill your hole, you know, use a uh, tap and drill chart to figure out what hole to drill. And then uh, um, tap the hole, it's just straight threads. It's not like pipe threads or anything. It's just like a regular bolt thread. And then you can see it's got a little O-ring. Um, I also put like liquid pipe dope on here um, just for added peace of mind and to kind of act as like a Loctite to keep this from ever trying to fall out. Um, so when the cord goes through here, this, is, this has got like a tapered rubber liner in it. And as you tighten this nut, it collapses down and seals nice and tightly around that, that wire cord. Now this is nice and uh, round, this jacket and it fits real nice in here. Um, so I'm gonna get, and, and something else like, especially like in my case, being that I'm not taking these bearings apart, um, you wanna do all the work from the outside, um, all the drilling and tapping so that no chips can get up into the bearings. Um, you know, with all this, this gear work, um, cleanliness is number one, like one speck of, grinding dirt or piece of sand, I mean, can, can wipe out your bearings. So, um, triple check all the clean, the cleaning. So I'm going to get this tapped and then I'm going to deburr the hole and everything from the bottom side and then really, uh, check it out really well to make sure there's no debris inside. And then I'll flip it back over, set it back up on my stand and, uh, get the case dropped in. Um, for the last time and then I'll show how to reset the backlash so let me get this tapped um, and then I'll be right back okay so here it is from the inside got the the hole tapped and the fitting put in place um, you can see the thread sealer stuff I used on there. Um, I like to do that just because it really kind of glues that guy in place and then really ensures that it's not gonna leak around those threads. It's got that little O-ring, but you're trying to seal against uh, kind of a rough casting that's not perfectly flat. So um, I feel like that's a good move. Um, better safe than sorry. So um, that's it. As far as the, as far as that passage, it's, it's kind of scary drilling a hole in these for the first time, but um, it's not that big of a deal. Um, the biggest thing you just gotta want to make sure that that wire is safe from getting wound up in the teeth. But you'll see once it's installed, because it kind of comes out of that magnet housing straight up, and then there's only going to be a an inch or two of wire visible inside the case, so it's really pretty safe. Um, and it's a whole lot easier than like an ARB air locker or something where you've got that rigid line you're trying to come up and out and bend and this is just much simpler. Um, so let me get it, uh, let me get it thrown in there and I'll show you. Okay, so I spun this around in my stand so that it's a little easier to see, but here you can see there's only, like I said, about two inches of wire inside the case before it goes through that little pass through. And then once I get this fully assembled, um, then I'll tighten this, uh, this gland nut down and that compresses the rubber around this and it, and it holds this in place nice and seals off the junction. So that's pretty much it for modifying the case. Um, you can see with that post, that's a little off, but you know, with that standing straight up, it puts the output of the wire at the like, you know, 12 o'clock position as it sits in the car. 
So I'm gonna get the, uh, get the caps loosely installed, and then I'll show how to set up the bearings to get the uh, proper backlash back to where it was. Let me get set up, hang on. Okay, so I've got everything put into place. Um, I got these guys finger tight to where you're, you're basically compressed the lock washers, but you're not tight, tight. Um, that way your, your threads are fully engaged. And then uh, get your magnet retainer bracket in there. Um, this needs to have a little play just so it doesn't bind up. So make sure that's, if you can hear that, that's got just a little movement. Um, <clears throat> same thing on this side, get these finger tight, um, get your indicator set up. And then what I like to do just, you know, if you're, if you're rotating this to check your lash, your pinion cannot turn because it'll throw you off. So what I like to do is clamp uh, a bar on here and then I can use my leg as I'm, as I'm, uh, rocking the top. I can put my leg against this to make sure that the pinion's not turning. And then I'll usually use a wrench too, just so I have a, a little more leverage on it and a little better control. But you can see my initial setup, I'm a little tight. It looks like about uh, I don't know, it's hard to see from my angle, but four or five thousandths. So I need to basically shift the whole carrier that way to, to loosen the contact between the teeth. The, the more you go this direction, the tighter the teeth will be with the pinion head down there. So I need to loosen this up. And so what I start with is the preload. Um, you need to basically compress the bearings together a little bit um, so that they're tight and you want to actually preload it a little. So it takes some practice and I've never found like a real, real spec um, for these. But what I do is I get it to where everything is just contacted. And then I go um, about a quarter turn, you know, one side or the other doesn't matter, but to compress it about a quarter turn or preload. And you want, well, you don't want to throw your indicator on the ground. Luckily I caught it. Um, you want there to be just a little resistance in this. Um, and again, it's kind of a, one of those things you learn by doing a bunch of them. Because you, you need this case to be, you know, these two towers to be kind of spread apart a little bit. So it's got some tension on it because as you apply power to this, those teeth want to spread themselves away from each other. They want to, that, that pinion wants to kick itself out of the ring gear. And so you need to fight that with, with, the, with the case. Um, so... Anyway, so I, I start with the preload. I get to where that's got a good feel. You know, and really to do it right, the pinion needs to be out and all this stuff, but whatever. It's one of those things that comes with practice. So now basically what I need to do is, is turn this one clockwise and this one counterclockwise the same amount. So that way my preload stays the same, but the whole thing will shift outward. And... You know, it doesn't take a lot. So I'm probably, hopefully this isn't too much, but I'm gonna rotate this up to where this hole is straight up to line up with that, with that locking tab. So I'm gonna go to there, same thing on both sides and then see, and then recheck my backlash. So I'm gonna do that and then I'll get reset up and, and bring the camera back. Okay, so I rotated that to get that, that one uh, opening straight up. Um, same thing on the other side and it brought me to uh, six thousandths. Um, I've found conflicting numbers. Um, I've seen four to six thou backlash, and I've seen uh, in some places six to eight, um, and some places as high as six to 12. So I'm at six, so no matter which one of those um, specs you go by, I'm within, the, I'm within them, so. So six thousandths is where I'm going. Um, so now basically just got to um, torque these down. Um, I like to pull them out one by one, um, break clean the threads again, and put Loctite on, and then put them in and torque them. And then last, you put these little uh, 
retainer clips in there and again clean the threads and lock tight them especially these guys um, having these fall out i've seen it happen it's bad news um so that basically wraps up the stiff um i'll probably do a a video on the rear as well but um uh, quicker maybe even just like a time lapse version i don't know we'll see but there we go i'll get this finished up and then um i'm not sure that i'm going to show the reinstallation of all this stuff maybe some of the high you know uh some of the important things um i'll show the adjustment of the kingpins um, to get the proper preload on those um probably setting up the wheel bearings as well um if you haven't done this stuff before those things are critical um but as far as putting the diff back in you know all that stuff it's so easy you just basically got to clean your surfaces uh, a thin layer of gasket maker and that's it so i'm going to get that get that diff wrapped up get those bolts uh get these all torqued oh i so these guys um, i scribbled this down but again i'm going to put this in the description the ring gear bolts 58 to 65 foot pounds and the carrier cap bolts 51 to 72. so i did these um i usually will split split the difference on specs like that so i i did 62 and then these all do 70. um that's pretty much it so this guy's ready to go um once i get this all installed i will show uh wiring this guy up um on just one of them but this is literally so simple <laughs> there's a couple ways of doing it but um the polarity doesn't matter because it's just an electromagnet but one side gets grounded one side gets 12 volts positive and that's all you need um these kits do come with uh, basically the harness with everything you need. Um, switches. Um, this is the, uh, the connector that's gonna go onto that, that pigtail sticking out of the housing. So those, those two wires will snap into there and then this little guy is kind of the lock. And then See the matching end and then you know this is a pretty simple little harness it's got a inline fuse um, two wires straight to the battery um, for a samurai it's super long um, i usually will cut them down that's pretty much it um, the one thing that can be done doesn't have to be done is the down the downside of this harness being straight to the battery is you could easily forget to turn your lockers off and that thing would just sit there and, and eventually run your battery dead. Um, not a bad idea to find a switched source off of uh, like ignition hot to connect that to. Um, the switches are lit, but you know, in the daytime, you can't always see that. So that's something I'm gonna discuss with the owner of the Samurai, see what he wants to do that's something to think about um and again i'll show that stuff in greater detail when i get to it so i'm gonna get this stuff uh, buttoned up and uh i'll bring you back when i'm setting up these uh these knuckles okay so i got the uh the diff installed um something i wanted to bring up um is before you install the knuckles um if you're staying with stock axle shafts, you can go ahead and put these in first and get your preload set and all that. But if you're upgrading to RCV axles, um, I'm not sure of the other brands. I imagine they're probably similar. Um, the actual bell, the bell of the CV is, um, it's larger. So these will not fit through These won't fit through the opening in the knuckle. 
um, whereas the stock ones do. So you've got to install these first before you start putting the knuckles on. Um, something to keep in mind. Um, if you're not aware, nothing compares to these. Um, I've got three King of the Hammers races and I mean, basically the entire time I've had mine built, I've had these RCVs in it. And, um, you know, it's been through King of the Hammers three times. It's been on the Rubicon Trail. Um, lots of, uh, you know, full throttle, dump in the clutch stuff in the sand dunes and uh, rally cross racing. Uh, I've, been, I've been pretty hard on them and uh, they just take it. Um, so worth the money in my opinion. I don't have any experience with other brands, but you know, to me, RCV is known in the industry as being the best and to save a hundred dollars or something on another brand that, you know, may or may not be as good to me, it's just not worth it. Um, and these are made in America. They are uh, lifetime gu guaranteed against breakage. Um, so can't, can't go wrong in my opinion. So Definitely something I would consider um, if you're putting a locker in the front of a Samurai. So, um, so I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get these thrown in. Um, something to keep in mind as well, um, now that this has the larger 26 blind axles, um, they're actually snug going through the seal, um, whereas the older ones have passed right through and the old shaft had a uh, like a polished larger diameter right here that the seal rode on. Everything else was narrower and would slide right through the seal. So you don't wanna just shove these through in a straight way. Um, you could actually damage the seal. I mean, these are pretty smooth, but you know, you could probably, you can see in the light. I don't know, the, the tips of the splines are pretty smooth, but what I like to do is put a, put a little grease on here, um, put some grease in the seal, and then when I stick them in, is I try to not just push them in straight, but, but continuously rotate the shaft as I'm sliding it through the seal. Um, so that way you're not like sawing in one you know concentrated area on each of these splines in that seal. You spread the load out and uh, I haven't had any issues with them whatsoever leaking, so I don't know how necessary that is, but in my mind, that's just something to do. Um, you know, as this rotates through the seal, you're not gonna be just trying to slice it in one spot. So that's my trick. Um, so I'm gonna get this seal, or the shafts put in and start setting up the knuckles, and then I'll show the, uh, the preload adjustments on, the, on, on these bearings, their shims. Um, you can adjust. So I'll show that when I get to it. Okay, so I skipped ahead a little here. My uh, camera battery died and I was on a roll, so I kept going. Um, so I got the knuckle on. So first off, before you do anything, you wanna slide on your, uh, your two seals, the felt and the rubber. Um, the felts, you know, it doesn't matter which way it goes. The rubber, you'll see you know, one side is contoured to fit against the surface of the ball. So you wanna make sure you put it on that way. Um, if you go over the top, around the, the boss where the bearing goes with the seals and then stretch around the bottom, um, they both stretch over pretty easily. Um, the next, you drop in your greased bearings, um, pack them with grease just like you would a wheel bearing. Um, take one hand and hold the bottom bearing in there while sliding the knuckle in place with the other hand and then uh, it's, it's a little awkward, but it's doable with two hands. And you slide your kingpins in place, put the bolts in. Um, so I start, usually, as long as no one's really messed with this stuff, you know, whatever the factory shims are typically works out. Um, they come in 20 thousandths thickness or four thousandths thickness. Um, this one had a 20 and a 20. And so I put it back um, together with those same shims. And then you want to find a little, uh, get yourself like a little fishing scale. Um, and then you hook it on. 
you hook it on the tie rod point and then you know this isn't going to read accurately because the, ax the axle's in there now which adds some stiffness but you want you want like four pounds two to four pounds i always go for the heavy side um because it's you know everything i work on is getting used off-road with bigger tires and so a little extra preload um is good so four pounds um of resistance it's so if you put it together and it's too loose um then you need to go thinner and if you know the opposite if it's too tight you need to add more shims you don't want to crank them down crazy tight um because the bearings can they, they can uh pound grooves in the races which they kind of they can do over time anyway but if you make them too tight, it's just hard on the bearings. Not a good idea. So I did that. Um, I slid the spindle snouts on. Um, the inside of this guy is a like a bronze bushing um, that the shaft rides on, right inside this area. So you want to get that good and clean and put new grease on it. Um, and that basically gets you caught up to where I'm at. Um, I've got to work on getting the backing plates and the caliper mount get these guys all cleaned up. I got some old grease and dirt and mud and whatever on them. Get those cleaned up and get those bolted back in place. And then I'm going to get back or get on top of the, uh, get, getting the bearings packed. And then I'll show uh, my method of, of getting these bearings set. Uh, so again, well, that's kind of a critical thing with these is getting that, that just light amount of preload on here, two to four pounds. Um, and it's always a good idea as best as you can to keep the thicknesses even, you know, say you got a 20 here, you, you don't, you wouldn't want a 20 and a four because that's going to shift your knuckle off center. Um, they're built to be equally shimmed. So as close as you can, I think, you know, in some cases you could be, you know, say four thousandths off and that's close enough. Um, but you always want to shoot for equal. And that's pretty much it for that. Uh, once I get these parts cleaned up, I'll show the order that they go on and then, uh, you know, then packing the wheel bearings. So let me get these uh, parts cleaned up and I'll come right back. All right, well, I got these hubs all cleaned out. And then, so this one looks pretty nice. Um, this guy, this was the one on the passenger side um, that, where I said it looked like it got some water in it. You can see the rust. Um, it was a lot worse. I took a just a little wire brush on a drill and just knocked off all the loose stuff, make sure there was nothing, no flakes or anything that could uh, work its way into the bearings. So if you got something like this, just make sure it's good and clean. Um, <clears throat> any kind of hard metallic or dirt debris going through the bearings will wipe them out right away. So just make sure you're all good and clean. Okay, so I've got the hub on. Um, and just real quick, so in these rebuild kits, it gives you a whole new um, set of hardware for the wheel bearings. So the first thing is you'll put the outer bearing in place, and then you'll slide this washer. Um, it's got the keyway um, tang that's going to go into the groove. Um, it's probably hard to see because it's covered in grease, but the, gr the groove is right there. Uh, the way these spindles bolt on, it, it'll either face forward or face backward, and it really doesn't matter which way. Um, so you put that on, so outer bearing, washer, and then the first spindle nut. So this is, this is the hardware for the other side, but you'll do, maybe this will be easier to see, washer, nut, and then this is the lock washer. Um, and again, it also has a tang for the, for the groove. So you'll line that up. That'll get put on top of the first nut and then this is the lock nut and so these little tabs will get bent two two for each nut so two of these tabs will get will get bent into the hub to grab onto the first nut and then once the second nut is in place you'll select another set of tabs that line up and bend them outward to grab this nut so that's just, that's basically the hardware stack and how it goes. So right now, 
I just have the first nut finger tight. Um, you can see this is got a little tension on it, but it's relatively easy to turn. So what you want to do is tighten this first nut down pretty hard at first, just to seat the bearings, to make sure the bearings are in. Totally straight. So now this is, I can turn it by hand, but you know, it's definitely got some uh, tension on it. So now I'll take and reverse it. Reverse it about a half a turn and then come back clockwise and come in. And this is kind of a, you know, I'm sure there's somewhere, there's probably some actual like inch pound or foot pound rolling resistance torque for this, but uh, I don't know those values and I've always just done this by hand. Um, so you tighten it down to where, you know, you can, you can turn it with a finger, but it, it's, it's, it takes a little bit of uh, effort to turn it. Um, but not, and you can see that it's not, not rocket science. Um, so now you take this guy, this, this particular one, this tang is bent 90 degrees. Hopefully that's visible. Um, I usually go inwards with that. Like that. Make sure it's, it's seated nicely against the first nut. And then you'll take the second nut. Um, these are really fine threads. And with this keyway, they can be easy to cross thread. So my trick is you want to push nice and flat and actually we'll turn it counterclockwise a little bit and you'll feel when it, it, it kind of clicks in. When the, uh, the last thread, I just felt it there. And then you just carefully turn it clockwise. If it doesn't go easily, um, you're not straight, you're not square, whatever. So if you can't if you can't finger thread it in all the way on, something's not right and, and back up and do it again. Because if you cross thread this, um, that's a mess. So once I get this, I try to basically turn these as tight as I can um, with my fingers or you know, the help of the socket until the two nuts are aligned with each other. And then that gets me um, to where it's holding that lock washer tight between the nuts. And then I'll, I'll find a set of tabs that line up with the flats of the inner nut and I'll take a, a punch and I'll tap those in. And then I will go ahead and torque this outer nut down pretty hard um, and then bend two tabs out on it. Um, Okay, one of my one of my favorite tools for this kind of work is just a regular chisel, but I've ground the end flat. If you can see that it's got about a three sixteenths wide flat on it. Um, it's useful for these tabs. That way you're you're hitting across the full length of the tab and you're not cutting into it. And then it's also uh, it works pretty good for the outer nut. You can use it kind of to pry them up. Lock washer is locked down. Now cinch down. It's basically the lock nut. And you know this needs to be tightened down pretty tight, but. <clears throat> you know, these threads are very fine, and so the clamping force is huge. Um, so you don't have to go crazy. So what I do, though, is, is keep an eye on these tabs and, and get it snug, and then try to 
find a good spot to land so I can bend the tabs over on the flat. You can see that one's lined up nice, so I'll hit that one and that one. Let's see this chisel works good to pry those forward to get them started and then finish them off. That's that. You know, and this should have some resistance, but not be. You know, I can I can turn it with a finger. So that's basically it for the wheel bearings. So now that I've got all the tools set up, I'm gonna go do the other side off camera. And then um, the next thing we'll do is get the, get this uh, locking hub, get this all cleaned up and re-greased and then installed. So that'd be the next thing. Um, I'm not going to show the cleaning on camera, but um, one thing that these are pretty sensitive to is these, these, I don't know what you call these, like it's splined basically. And then on the locking hub, you know, that's where this engages. This needs to be completely free of any grit or dirt or mud. Um, and then just a real light coating of grease on this guy, because if you put in too much grease, um, when this extends to lock the hub, if, if this is packed full of grease, there's no room for this. So just a real light film um, on all this stuff. And then um, that's all it takes really. And then I'll show in better detail when I put it together, but these kind of only go together. Um, a certain way and when it's clean I'll be able to show why but you can see there it'll basically go that position or 180 from it but any you know there's six possibilities and only two of them work so just pay attention to that um, and it's basically there's this spring seat retainer kind of thing up in here it's got matching um, splines and you can see there's these two that have the wide opening and the rest are like a double opening. And so you've got to get that lined up. So, so if it doesn't go, don't force it. Just keep trying positions until it goes. So when I come back, this will be clean and I'll show uh, how to put this together, um, the proper torque for those six bolts and then putting the dial on. Okay, so I got this hub all cleaned up, got all the nasty, dirty grease out of it. Um, the center part that rotates, there's a snap ring on the outside of that. If you pop that out, then the guts come out, and it's a lot easier to get in there and clean. And then, you know, where this surface where it rotates, I put a thin film of new grease in there, so now it spins nice. Um, so if you're doing a full rebuild in the kit, will be new um, hub body gasket. So that goes under here. So I usually will take one of the bolts, stick it in to help kind of guide the, the gasket, get the uh, axle shaft lined up, splined in place. carefully once you get two of the bolts started then the gasket will stay in place and line up easily so what I, what I do is I put five of these in place um, get them snugged down and then the sixth one you screw into the end of the axle shaft 
and pull out on it and that'll expose the groove um, for the little snap ring that goes in, in place there. Clean this off. So this little snap ring goes on the end of the axle. So if you put that, that one bolt in place, because the axle has a little bit of movement to float in and out, if it goes in, you can't, the, the groove gets hidden by the, the guts of the hub there. So I'm gonna get these all in. Um, when I come back, I'll have the torque spec. I don't remember off the top of my head, I gotta look it up. I believe it's 22 foot pounds, but I'll double check. Um, so I get two of these snug to get the body seated, pull this out, put the snap ring in, and then put this bolt where it goes, and then torque all those to the proper spec. So hang on one sec. Okay, so the dry flange bolts um, the spec is 14 and a half to 21 and a half foot pounds. Um, I usually go to the high side on these just to get as much, uh, clamping force as possible. Um, but you know, with bolts, you don't want to go too high cause you'll, you'll stress them out and make them break too easily. So, uh, I would never go more than the torque spec, but to the high side for these is where I go. Um, I work on a lot of Samurais, so I built this little handy dandy hub holder tool. That way I can get a grip on this thing while I torque it. So I got my wrench set to 21 and a half. Now you want to do it in a uh, kind of a crisscross star pattern. Again, if you have, once you've installed this front locker, these are something you definitely want to keep an eye on. Um, with good axle shafts, um, these bolts are definitely the weak link in these front axles, which isn't a bad thing because uh, they can be fixed. You know, it's an, basically like an external fuse to this front end. Um, and most cases they can be fixed even on the trail. Um, if you're doing pretty rough wheeling, it's not a bad idea to have a uh, drill and a bolt extractor set and a set of bolts to, to take with you. Um, I always go around twice. <clears throat> um, I have run the stock bolts. I have run um, some heavy duty bolts. Um, they're actually listed, I bought them through Trail Gear, I believe. They're listed for a Toyota, but they're, they work. Um, you have to put an extra washer under the head. Um, but in my opinion, they broke as easy, if not easier than these. Um, had terrible luck with them. Um, but definitely, Keeping them tight is the main thing. Um, if you still have a lot of issues breaking these, um, which I did, um, I have a video showing how to upgrade this to uh, a much larger bolt size. Um, so far I've had no, no trouble with mine. Um, so these are a eight millimeter bolt, which is basically five sixteenths. And in my setup, um, I go to a 7 16 bolt size. Um, if you watch that video, it, I do a pretty good job showing the difference, um, but just a lot bigger diameter and more length um, into the hub. Um, and then that, uh, the torque value goes from the 21 and a half to um, I believe 56 foot pounds. So it's got a huge amount more clamping force holding those two pieces together. And uh, I did that right before my second King of the Hammers race. And so I've got two races on it and a Rubicon trail trip and all my other stuff and zero failures. Um, I still throw a torque wrench on them every once in a while just to make sure they're tight. Um, but 
they've been solid. Um, definitely, definitely is a good way to go if you have if you have trouble breaking these off. Um, so the last thing now is putting the hub dial on, and um, let me grab that and show you. Okay, so I got this thing cleaned up as best I can. Um, I mentioned it before. If you look at these splines. Um, you got double, 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 and then these two wide openings. So if you look carefully, there's kind of a little finger bent in between these two splines and the same thing 180 across from it. So that little finger won't fit because of this. So it has to go into that, that wide slot. Um, and then you want to make sure if this has gotten goofed with while it's been off, you want the bolt hole to be lined up with those and then make sure the you're fully um, in the unlock position. And then uh, the rebuild kit that the customer provided didn't have these gaskets. Um, I had some in my parts, spare parts box. Um, so I'm gonna put new gaskets in there. Yeah, these gaskets are pretty tight fit and they're pretty fragile. So just take your time, make sure they're fully seated. There's some um, little bumps that, that align with these splines. Make sure the gasket is, is around those and fully seated. And then again, you gotta find, the, find that little tab that needs to go into the wide slot. And make sure, make sure that it fully seats against the body without having to force it. If it doesn't, something's not right. And then these little bolts, um, I believe the torque is like uh, nine to 12 foot pounds or something on these. Um, I don't tighten these down hard. They're little tiny bolts. You can break them off or strip them out really easily. Um, I just do them by hand. Just, but if, if you're uh, you know, new to this and haven't done it very often, I recommend following the torque spec. So that's that. I'll get those tightened up. Um, I've got to unbox. This is getting all new brakes, new rotors. Um, I don't think I really need to show that. I mean, it's literally the caliper slides on, or the rotor slide just slides over the hub. Caliper's just got the two bolts that go into here, and that's it. So um, that basically wraps up this front end. Um, I've got a couple other things I'm going to do. Um, it's getting some new steering parts and some other stuff, but that doesn't really uh, matter for a locker installation. Um, so yeah, that wraps up part three. Um, thanks for watching. I'm gonna have the next part four will be the rear, um, the rear e-locker, um, and that'll be a lot, a lot, a lot less information. It's a lot simpler of a job than the front. Um, and then the next part is gonna be the little two-inch lift I've built to put on this rig. So thanks again for watching. Uh, if you got any questions, reach out. Um, I'm more than happy to help people. Um, you know, and really. If you're new to doing this kind of stuff, um, this is totally an accessible job for, for a new, you know, or a, a low experienced mechanic or, you know, someone new to this hobby. Um, these rigs are great to work on. They're really simple. Um, and again, nothing that I've done on this front axle requires any special tools or knowledge or setups or you know, if you've got 
a pretty basic set of tools and and somewhere to work. I mean, you can do this yourself. It's easy. Um, so thanks again. Um, keep your eyes out for part four.